Anyways, I want to just talk about a few of these these things tonight, because uh, I, I uh, the, the uh, oral folklore is, is strictly stories, uh, songs, uh, proverbial lore, songs. It is it is it is strictly what is passed on orally. Now, when you have customary folklore, there's talking goes with that too, because uh, you know. But also, but also, a custom. There is sometimes action goes with it. For instance, people will say to you, uh, "Don't. It's bad luck to meet people on the stairs." Well, or it's bad luck to put up your umbrella in the house. Or and don't change the calendar before the the the. the, the you know that, okay? That is a, is a behavior along with. Um, along with the saying, there's behavior with it. It's, it's something you don't do or you do do. Don't whistle in a bubble. Never whistle in a bubble. Sort of, I almost had to swim ashore the first time I did that. <laughs> anyways, uh, uh, anyways uh, I want to talk a little bit about the very first one, folk speech and naming. Uh, and the reason I want to do that is that there are, there are uh, as you can imagine, uh, kind of words that people are playing here. Now, you might not know me, and I'm, I'm probably just preaching to the converted, but Celtic words and Celtic phrases and Celtic terms of phrase crept in that you couldn't kill them out. And they retained those. And I was just, uh, well, there is a couple of words that I grew up with. A puzzle, and it's a good old word. And, and uh, if, if indeed it puzzle is fox, there's an Irish equivalent that would sound something like it. And I can guarantee you it would have been used in the Gale, Irish Gaelic. Uh, Skillet is one I can't track down. They both mean small of not what puzzle is. It's a very subtle difference. If you go out, or at least the way it was when I grew up, you went out and you went looking for, say, Irish moss on the shore, and you went back home, and you had got a, just a small amount. You, somebody would ask you, you say, oh, say, oh, I got a little puzzle. But if you got none, you said, not still. <laughs> so one is, you know, there's, there's sort of opposites. Now, you know, th this, this phrase here, which is a common Irish phrase, People say it's common, but the people where I grew up used it so naturally. Uh, it's a warning, of course. Uh, it, it's, my mother was more than half Irish, and she would make the prediction, if they do that, they'll be waiting on the green. Now, I'm sure you've all run across it. You, you, you've heard it, and you'd like to hear it people use it so naturally here. And of course, it's Anglo, it's, it's it's English, but yet it's Irish, part of the Irish culture. Uh, they had an awful wrestle, uh, the, the, our, our Celtic forefathers, with. Oh, by the way, I was reading, and uh, I was reading the other day that uh, somebody said <coughs> that the Celtic would be the uh, yeah. and there was fifty different ways to say the word darling. And I remember this thing, George Connor and Rip Hall at the time he was 12. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, by the time I met him at university, he knew them all. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, it's, 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 they say it's the language of love, it's an incredibly expressive language, the Celtic language. And uh, you know the Scotch uh, uh and they say it was East Charles who grew up in the Scotch speaking. Yeah, yeah, was Possible avoid using it. If they had to use it, they knew they were using the second best language. Simple as that. Uh, that's the way they talked about it. Uh, uh, there's a story which most of you will have heard before. Uh, when, and this is the problem again, when they came to class with, when they came to a new speaking world, and our Irish ancestors, the Scots ancestors, 
language that was books. That was uh, just would do trick. No language will when you try and translate. And, and, to, and the, the Tom Dunn, the great Tom, the great storyteller Tom Dunn, and I told the story for that told him as an example, lived in Lot 7 and passed down the story. Uh, we were and there were a lot of people killed, and some of them were using a lot of people killed. Now, I'll talk about that later, but in this particular tale uh, that I'm thinking about here, Tom, who was passed down to me, Tom Dodd, told that when he was a young man, he always put himself as the humble hero of the stories. And when he was a young man, he was challenged to a long action that this. Example from the uh, 
from the Islander newspaper in 1864, uh, what basically what has happened, this by the way happens in my community. This man and a boy, a Highlander by the name of McDonald, uh, looking for his captain. And he's got a young boy with him. And what should they run across? Of course, he walked to there and he ran across there and two cubs, a mother bear and two cubs. And the young fellow took off running one way, and the dog ran the other in the bear chase. And he was almost exhausted. And so he climbed, there was, there was no paper there to find all the So he saw a tree just the right size, and he climbed up the tree, and the bear after him. Uh, and it says here, he thinks of standing and fighting, for he has heard how his kinsman, Captain Roderick, had single-handed for a day fought a bear, and how John Campbell of Sparrow's Road, where's Sparrow's Road? Where is it? Near Montague. Near yeah. John Campbell of Sparrow's Road had also engaged one, and both got off with their lives. And then again, as he still runs, he thinks of fireside story that a bear cannot climb a small tree. And, and live or die, he resolved to test its truth. Soon a tree catches his eager and bloodshot eye, and with the agility of a Highlander, he grasps the friendly branches. But the savage brute grasps his heel and draws him down for only a second. Oh, sorry. Anyway, the bear tries to climb up and doesn't succeed, and the dog ran into the air, and he's looking down, and he says, and this is the point I'm making to you about this gender problem, he said, uh, Look, he looked calmly down and said, Dick, if herself had her gun, she'd give you something. <laughs> and anyways, <laughs> herself had uh, her. <laughs> anyways, the, the, the boy runs and brings back a rescue crew, led by Andrew Bell, another son. But this was, this was the sort of thing that you would, you would hear in, in island language at that time. And you don't see the movie talk. Uh, Stephen Leacock told, and he may have got this from Andrew uh, he, uh about this, this exact same phenomenon of the he and she. He said, uh, <coughs> Stephen Leacock said, he was walking down the street in Montreal, and he said, he had a great vision. He could see this man coming from a long way in the East. He was feeling no pain. Great big Highlander. And Hunter came up to Leacock and stopped him and he said, Her name will be Duncan McPherson and she'll be wanting 50 cents to get a drink. And Leacock said, hey, She'll be getting it too. And Leacock hates it to give money away. I don't know this. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's the sort, of, uh, the sort of thing you run across. Uh, I, can, I have to leave that. That's just a little bit of a post It just touches the surface. And I, 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 I can't stay with it. Uh, but you, you, you do get a strong sense of, of, uh, of this part of, of uh, our folklore. Uh, this, of course, uh, let's see where I was. Oh, by the way, I was, uh, <coughs> well, I'll talk about that later, I'm just, I'm just uh, thinking too far ahead. Uh, you get a whole lot of talk over here, and I, and I don't want more of this stuff, because I'm just trying to cheat, but uh, there are true proverbs that grew up here, uh, proverbs from folklore, from the word of the Lord, several good ones, that Hit the island so much, and they have a kind of public rhythm to them. The forms and the ground, and the farmers, and the farmers. Our farmers often use this when their wives complain that the house wasn't being kept up. And the answer was a proverb, which was, uh oh, by the way, the wives would also be complaining that all the money was going to fixing up the barn. Something 
the other one was. Uh, Uh, that I found uh, that I've been 
really identify in an island folklore. And uh, I'll tell you, it's, uh, I'll read it for you. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know whether I've time or not. The fact of the matter is, years ago there was a farmer who had a son who was almost grown and an, adop and an adopted boy. And the adopted boy had a little red bull which his grandparents gave him, and the son was jealous. And the little bull always came in at the end of the herd. And one day the son said, The one who comes in at the end of the herd will be killed for beef. And the adopted boy didn't want the little bull to die, and so he told him to come in at the middle instead of at the end of the herd. And the next day the little bull came in the middle, and a big black milk cow was at the end. And the son said, We can't kill her. It will have to be the one in the middle of the herd. And so then she moves to the front of the herd, and finally the end has come, and the, the son, the one that comes in at the front, will be killed. And the adopted boy told the bull to move again, and the little bit of red bull said, I'm to be killed, and that's that. But when I'm gone, you will be my friend, and you will find a treasure and never want for it. <laughs> Don't come 
not there. It's not a good thing. It's a bad thing. And let me give you, uh, from what I can find out, this is what they're talking about. And it's an ancient. Uh, and I can't pronounce this word either. Please forgive me. Uh, it's, I'm still looking for more of my notes and can't find it. Uh, it's something called the sluot. Uh, 
story. Uh, there's one which is called Edward.
where my one of my my folks on the left was a swimmer, and they were sitting. Just, I said, "What does this verse mean?" And finally, I said, "I'm oh, going to have to draw you a picture." So you listen. You know. Brain belly broad.
consume them. But uh, for the spreading of news and the small amount of culture that remained to them. And so it came to pass that ballads on every theme, from courtship to politics, were carried through the country to be sold at fairs and other rural gatherings. And of course, it came to America. It came to America in by the thousands, literally. And they came to PEI. And uh, uh, the, the first crop of that kind of ballad, Very, very many, if, if any. But I, I ran across this, and it's from a Charlotte Island newspaper in 1852. My, uh, I know she was an Irish girl, and I know she was a traveling singer, but that's all I know about her. Her name was Miss Heron, which is a good Irish name. Uh, and she, here's what it says, and I've only got one stanza of this. It's a song that they printed in the newspaper. It was so popular when she sang it. 1852, the Islander, December 3rd, the bold soldier boy. Uh, as so much celebrated Miss Heron with great applause. And uh, yeah, but anyway, there she was singing, and uh, uh, there's not a trade that's going worth showing or known like that from Glory Growing from the Bold Soldier Boy. Where right to left we go, sure you know, friend or foe, we'll have a hand or toe from the Bold Soldier Boy. There's not a town who march through, but ladies looking arch through the window pane will search for the ranks to find their joy. While up the street each girl yeah, yeah. with a look so sigh will cry to my eye, is it the dark, the Bold Soldier Boy? This was falling on fertile, fertile ground. Every Irishman in Charlotte would be there, uh, wanting to hear this. Uh, I, I read about that. Uh, I don't know what sort of music uh, there there would have been. Uh, I, I don't know that. I don't know what sort of music could be in any band, maybe not. But uh, anyway, she seems to be very popular. I know uh, there was a reading uh, account of uh, again. Talking the Irish here. And I should have brought them. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to say that. It was in 1810. Uh, this was written in 1889, but about the uh, then cat I think. Uh, probably it might have been the Yankee Gale or it might have been the Yaga Gale of 1872. Anyway, there's an uh, American swimmer there. Uh, of the same niche. She came ashore and they all to off uh, her uh, without getting the ground. And there were three or four fiddlers on that vessel, and they put the fiddle in the barrel, threw it over, and the fiddle came ashore. And that was fine. One man on board that vessel was named John H. John T. Watson. Firing these, would you play this one? And, and this old lady, uh, she, she said, Can you play? I can't even remember what it was. The Devil Among the Tailors or something like that. That's uh, an Irish tune. And he said, Yes, I can play that. She said, Oh, she said, That's not my ear, that's not my ear, and that's lingering. So, anyway, so he played his way. And remember how pernicious it was to have a game. So he played all these, and, and it was kind of a break, and uh, he did it very, they said that this little old Acadian fellow poked him in the ribs, and he said, Monsieur Unibou Jouet, and the Marquette, could you play the French national anthem? <laughs> so he didn't want to be left out, so it was a really a great time. And of course, the priest, meanwhile, was passing 
uh, uh, the, the hat around to pay on the organ, and they have, they, they have got 60 pounds or something like that. Mostly in small thumbs. <laughs> anyway, uh, getting back to the broadsides. Getting back to the broadsides, and I know that uh, this is, uh, I know that this is uh, getting late, uh, and uh, but I, I want to. Uh, those songs came in here, would have come in here from Ireland with the original settlers. And then in later years, there were so many, because of these American culture was so strong, that they were also coming to the States. Uh, migrant workers were coming from the late 1890s. My grandfather was bringing back some that he learned from the Irish working around Boston. And there were Irish, some of them were. Irish songs, and some of them were, were American Irish songs. Uh, I'm just trying to think uh, just a second now. Yeah, well, you know, here's some of the, the, the here are some of the song books, just some of the songs, and these were all in tradition here. Yes, uh, and that was all in tradition here, and, and not only that, but the local song makers may pattern their songs after me. Uh, and I'll show you a great song maker, Dave Nish, made a song called Nish and Roll, and I'm more, which is just the first <coughs> of this. I want to play you, see if I can find this now, because this machine is, is, is very cranky. Uh, I don't know. I want to just play you, see if I can play you this. It's a, it's a traditional singer, actually comes in runway. I said to you earlier, these songs are all sung uh, very slowly, but this man has this incredible Irish look. I mean, he's in a, a number of, a, a number of, people, of Irish descent, an old woodman. And you can understand when you hear this song, why it was that we loved this song so much in the 1960s, because we, we were drawing on the same tradition as he, he was, and his song is, is, is very good. Uh, just a second. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, forgive me for all of you. Uh, just a second. Uh, okay. I don't know how loud I can say this. Finish up, I'll show you what one uh, is 
authority on, on, on these valid sets. And I'm going to see if I would have better seen you one or two of them. Uh, oh dear. My. Okay, there it is. Uh, this song, again, is, is an Irish broadside. Uh, word song. Journalism, uh, very lurid accounts. It's like watching CNN. 
Uh, 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 Irish ballads stayed away from that. Essentially naive, it leans heavily towards the romantic in content and treatment. Its favorite topics are those dealing with the experiences of young lovers, and there's so many love songs, you know. Uh, and it tells these stories tenderly, fluently, and musically, with emphasis upon the ideal qualities of character. It looks nostalgically, nostalgically towards Ireland, and of course that is true, we get so much of that. Uh, it makes people who have never been to Ireland lonesome for Ireland, some of those songs. Uh, it looks nostalgically towards Ireland as the green and flowery island of handsome young men and beautiful girls. And it celebrates high morality, freedom, justice, and undying love. Well, you know, a good example of that, or one example, is in one verse of this. This is, again, the song is the tradition here in the Latin Greece. The class brother is those groups when they began to sing. It's no wonder they said that they, they, they made a lot of appearances here because this was a backwater, I mean, economically. And yet they came here because people loved that music because it was a kind of music. Yes, some slightly different, but the kind of music that people, that was part of people's culture here. And when they sang in Bremen on the Moor, when they sang, uh, while alone the boy, and we sang all those, and, and this song they sang, and this song was already in tradition here.
Massachusetts the, 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 the Monahans that I knew who were Kelly's Cross Monahans yeah. were good singers. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. definitely yeah. good singers. Yes, he came from Kelly's Cross, that's right. Oh, is that so? Okay. Yes. Well, uh, uh, I knew uh, the old Nick up there, uh, Nick's uh, grand, great grandson. I grew up with him, same age as me, and he was a good singer. And he used to sing all the time when we were kids. Some of them were not proper, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> but he learned a lot of stuff around the shore where I grew up and it wasn't all the good things. But no, there, there are just so many, and they haven't been collected. Uh, they still haven't been collected, and of course we're, we're, missing, we're missing out on, on folks every day. Um, I, I think I said last year that I, I had lost in the previous year two men that I knew and were wonderful singers, both great Irish singers. One who sang the most famous of all broadsides, um, the Flying Cloud, who starts to Irish, my name is Edward Lawler, as you will understand. Uh, born in the city of Waterford in Ireland, Ireland, sadly. And uh, that was Joseph Bulger, Ben McNutt, and, uh, and, uh, and a uh, cousin of Joseph's, Harold Kelly, who was an absolute wonderful singer. He must have been incredible when he was young. Must have been incredible. He didn't have told me that story, by the way, before you were getting it. Uh, it wasn't really from Boston, really where his folks were. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, well, uh, some were that you all heard them. Uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, I was seeing, uh, uh, I remember one that, uh, that Mrs. Jim Hendergast used to sing called the, the Old Side Car, which again was an Irish, uh, an Irish uh, song. Uh, I would say every Irish, not American, but Irish. Uh, no, I haven't seen that song. They are romantic, and they're very lyrical, and they get away from this uh, 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 sort of, uh, uh, the first broadsides in England were like newspapers, basically. Uh, the old are okay, see if I can square it away here.
Well, yes, yes, because of course the situation is full of that's what what full of war is. It's pretty on the tradition it's tradition. It's tradition. Tradition is it are the things that were handed that are handed down. And some of them are very beautiful things that are handed down. Those are the things that I think that we we should um, we should try to keep and try to remember. Beautiful things in the tradition in here. They're all not all traditions, I suppose, are 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 good traditions. We see that in the world every day. But some of these things are you have to you have to know where where you came from. You have to know uh, you can't just live in a vacuum. Uh, whether you're Scots or Irish, and you have a uh, common heritage. And <coughs> you have characteristics that follow on from that. Uh, I'm not going to say genetics, but it's just uh, uh, you, you really have to, you really should know at least the good things. Uh, uh, I don't want to revel in all the bad things. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Uh, when you start singing, did you sing without uh, accompaniment? Yes, 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 I did. I, uh, I did. I what, was your, what would you say? Because I can't think of it right now, but I know I used to play it over and over and over and over. Oh, my. <laughs> my favorite song you mean back then? Oh, my. Uh, <laughs> I learned this. Wait, I learned it. But I am going to use my guitar when I play it. Uh, I have to do this. I was. Maybe it's the nickel I picked up for singing this song for the neighbors. <laughs> there was a fellow across the road, and he was a good Irishman too. And he would sing. And he would perform the song all too, all too often. <laughs> all too often. He came home singing. And I played with their children. And I learned this song from him. And my mother was not amused, but then she had enough uh, Irish in her to sort of be, uh, uh, it was kind of a little bit uh, humorous. Uh, and it goes like this. Anybody who knew this man who knows this song? From under the table, ask the boy with a bottle of beer. Tell your mother I wore a quarter, I'll be back to fair next year. <laughs> hey, oh, you got any daughters? Yes, I've had enough time for you. She's gone up for a bottle of water. When she comes back, I'll give her to you. I see lips moving in here. I'll give her to you. I'll give her to you. James 
subsequently died uh, after Peter and I think he had a, a, a brother, a brother, uh, was a little boy. And she married a cousin of James whose name was Ambrose Ambrose. And uh, they emigrated to the U.S. and began farming on the on the Dock Road, which was a, really a pioneer of community at that point, totally pioneer. I mean, they were cutting the road through. And Amber Semberly um, uh, lived there on a farm there. And uh, they were, they were, I know, they were good church people, and they had a child every nine months for 10 years. Uh, <laughs> uh, these would be half sisters and brothers to. Uh, to Peter, and recently I've been in contact with, with uh, a descendant of his uh, half sister Mary. Anyways, and it's hard enough for boys who don't often, there will always be some conflict with your father, uh, you, you know, but in the case of the father not being the natural father, this became worse. And that's why I say it was like, it was like Hamlet, and, and, and Peter ran away. It, 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 the neighbor saw him. The neighbor saw him hiding his clothes, and he stowed away in a vessel at about uh, which I think was called the Milford, the Milford Guy, Captain Clark. And he went to the mare machine, and this was a very fine young man, and everyone thought the world of him, a very likable. And he was there in no time until he uh, was, they were working in the, in the, where they were hiding the logs, high, high, uh, getting ready for the drive. And then he wrote a lot of killing. You know, it took him, he was hard. It took him two days to die. And he did talk about his personal situation and told him about his mother who he cared deeply about and, and the trouble to his father. And then he died, and uh, there was a blizzard, and the priest couldn't even get to, to, the, to the grave. Uh, <laughs> No more I roam your glory banks 
again for coming, and uh, uh, feel free to hang around the chat.